This is the story of Canada, the wild land. The year is 1867, and this is the way Canada was at the time of Confederation. It begins on the East Coast with the first contact. This is where the Europeans first came to the land. They found it a rough and rugged land. A land where, if they were going to live here, they had to endure many hardships. The Atlantic coast, however, provided a bounty of wildlife. Among them, seabirds. Many of the birds were easy to kill, and their eggs were often easy to collect. One bird in particular, the great auk, was very penguin-like and couldn't fly. It was easily slaughtered and became food. It was one of the first species to become extinct in Canada. But it was sea life that was the main attraction. Whales were abundant and easy to hunt. Fortunately, in the 20th and 21st century, the whales have returned to their former abundance. The same, however, cannot be said for the fish. Cod stocks dropped precipitously low in the last century and are now slowly returning. And with the cod, the other sea life are coming back. Seals, both harbor and gray, harp seals. But it was great fishing, and that fishing brought people from Europe. The Basque, the French, the English. They were coming here in the 1500s, and it wouldn't be till the 1600s before they started to settle. But one group had settled almost 500 years before that. The Vikings came at a place called the Lancel Meadows. They lasted only a few short years, but it was in the year 1000. And then they too left. A cooling climate and the warlike natives drove them away. Even today, large colonies of seabirds still exist. And one of the most spectacular seabirds is the northern gannet. Large colonies of these birds can be found in the Gas Bay and in Newfoundland, and then up into Europe and Ireland. They are actually relatives of the pelican. They nest on the cliffs, and the males and females perform an elaborate dance when they greet. but it is when they are diving the ocean that they are truly spectacular. It is the fish that brings the birds, but there are some large fish here too. White sharks are found here. Bald eagles are common here too. The geology of the land is spectacular as well. There are fossils that date back to the beginning of time, a time when parts of this land were actually connected to Africa. The highest tides in the world can be found in the Bay of Fundy. Eider ducks can be found here too. And after the nesting season, their down is collected to line coats and blankets to keep people warm. Venture inland and you'll find a land where caribou and wolves can be found. And at one time, grizzly bears were found in Labrador, but they were trapped to extinction. Black bears, however, are common and have expanded to fill the range of the grizzly bear. Black bears overwinter in dens. This is one such den. But there's other animals here too. There's red fox. And in the rivers, the salmon return every year. These are Atlantic salmon. And unlike the salmon found on the Pacific coast, they spawn multiple times and do not die at the end of their first spawning run. They fight their way up the mighty rivers. Canada's east coast is spectacular. 
And although it is the most degraded of all of our wild areas, because it's been used the longest, it still remains a spectacular place to see wildlife. Moose are quite common and have been introduced into Newfoundland. The first settlers that came here faced a harsh and tough land. But with perseverance, they survived and they carved out of the wilderness a place for people. Today, Canada's east coast remains an area rich in resources, but it is still a tough place to make a living. Winters here are long and cold. Yet people and wildlife persevere here. On Canada's wild east coast. Northern Canada, the barren lands, is defined by a harsh climate. Few trees grow here. This is a land of tundra and snow and glaciers. Yet, as harsh as it is, every year millions and millions of birds return here to feed. This is one of the best places, if you're a bird, to find food. It's also a place where you'll find beluga whales, the only white whale. Long-tailed ducks come here to nest. There's fish, like Dolly Varden. And beaver eke out an existence on the tundra as long as there are willow trees. The ducks and geese and the cranes all feed on the mosquitoes and black flies, and they are numerous. Arctic loons come here to nest, as do millions and millions of shorebirds. These birds will travel all over the world after they leave the tundra. So do Arctic terns. They make the longest migration of any bird in the world, flying right down to the tip of South America. This is a birder's paradise. This is a long-tailed Jaeger. It's a relative of the gull. Because the summers are long here, with 24 hours of daylight, plants can grow rapidly and do so. Thunderstorms are rare. But with climate change, they are happening more often. One of the largest migrations in the world of mammals takes place here. This is the caribou migration. It is a journey that takes them through mountain passes where pika and marmot live. On the slopes can be seen doll sheep, the white sheep of the north. These are also called thin horn sheep. The tundra is a simpler ecosystem. There are fewer species here, but even so, the processes of life play out. The sick sick or arctic ground squirrel is a popular menu item for the red fox. So too are ptarmigan. These birds turn white in the winter. Muskox, however, are very belligerent, and no fox in his right mind would attempt them. Grizzly bears also can be found here. These are the tundra grizzlies, and sometimes caribou fall prey to them. For the most part, the grizzlies, however, eat berries. 80% of their diet is plant food. Arctic hare can be found here as well, but all this means little to the caribou. They keep moving on, searching for food. Caribou will eat grass and even browse a little, but their primary food, especially in the winter, is the bacon. And there may be plenty of that around, but there's also plenty of insects, so they seek the tops of mountains or places where the wind blows to escape the buzzing insects. The coming of fall is a relief. It's too cold for insects. And this is when the caribou shed their velvet and their antlers at first are blood red. Fall is a restless time 
doll sheep males start to seek the females. And those millions of birds, well, it's time for them to migrate. They will head south where there's food and warmth, or where they want to be when winter comes. Grizzly bears have a final feed before they head up into the mountains to hibernate. They seek a safe, dry place in which to spend the winter. For the musk oxen, the caribou, and the doll sheep, this is the beginning of the rut. The males seek the females. Mixed herds begin to form, and males test each other in battles of strength. For the caribou, this means wrestling with their antlers. For the doll sheep, it means rearing up and crashing their heads together. The reality is, winter is coming, and winter lasts a long time. It is a harsh time, and if you have to live here, you need a good fur coat and some strategies to survive. White is a good color, and many of the Arctic animals either turn white, and some are white all year round. The musk oxen rely on size. The caribou seek the forest to the south. The ptarmigan turn pure white. The doll sheep grow a warmer coat. Life is tough here. Perhaps no animal is more symbolic or better suited for life up here than the polar bear. One of the largest bears in the world, polar bears are at home on Canada's Arctic shores and ice fields. They hunt on the ice for seals and they will spend most of the winter on the ice until once again summer returns to Canada's barren lands. The endless forest, the boreal forest, is one of the world's largest ecosystems. It literally stretches around the world in the northern hemisphere. It is a land dominated by spruce trees, a land of lakes, a land of bogs. The moose is ideally suited for it, with its long legs. So is the black bear. Red fox are common here. And one of the larger predators is the wolf. The gray wolf can be found throughout the boreal forest. Loons are common here too. In Europe and Asia, they're known as northern divers, but they're the same birds. Great blue herons hunt fish in the fresh water. And there are fish here too, like walleye and pike. But the surprising thing is, they haven't been here that long. The natural regions of Canada, as we know them, have only existed for around 7,000 years. 11,000 years ago, the Ice Age ended. And that unleashed a hodgepodge of environments and ecosystems that were all mixed together. Over the years, those ecosystems organized themselves into the districts we now think of, the tundra, the boreal forest, the Great Plains. There is no doubt, however, that people were here before these ecosystems evolved. The most recent estimates show people arriving into Ontario, for instance, about 10,000 years ago. On the west coast, they were probably there 20 to 25,000 years ago. On the east coast, it was probably much more recent, probably neighborhood of seven or 8,000 years. People followed the melting ice north into these new environments. The boreal forest is home to a surprising number of species. There are warblers and chickadees and of course ravens. But you will also find hummingbirds. This is the most northerly part of its range. Wood bison can be found here too. And along with them, one of the rarest birds in the world, the whooping crane, which nests in Wood Buffalo National Park. Just how far north the boreal forest goes depends on two things, altitude and latitude. The higher up a mountain, the colder it gets, the colder it gets, the less likely the forest can survive. And the same with heading north. 
The further north or south of the equator that you go, the colder the climate becomes. The fall is the rutting or mating season for moose. The bull's antlers are now hard, free of velvet, and they seek out the cows. The cows make a loud call. It's not easy to find a mate in a boreal forest. You just can't see far enough, so you make a lot of noise. As fall progresses, some birds decide to head south. The rough grouse stays, and so does the Canada jay. Many of the owls will leave if the conditions are hard enough. Loons, too, leave, and they change colors. Gone is the black and white, and now a gray bird takes its place. Fall is coming to an end, and winter will soon be here. And that's a time of strife for all living things in the north. It's basically food just goes away. There's no seeds. There's no insects. And most of the birds have left. Fishers can't hibernate, but bears can, and they sleep the winter away. Moose make do on twigs, which is very poor quality food. Beavers collect food and store it near their dams and lodges. The term busy as a beaver probably comes from this habit. The rut has taken a toll on the male moose. The bulls are tired. Red fox will leave their territories to find food wherever they can. If they're lucky, it'll be a good year for snowshoe rabbits. Winter comes with a vengeance in the boreal forest. Lakes freeze, snow falls. Black bears make their way to the dens. They somehow know when the snow is going to last, and they won't enter the den until they have good snow cover. But that comes, and soon the land is blanketed with white. When the lakes freeze, there's a problem. Where do you get drinking water from? Now, some of the birds can get it from the seeds they eat. But many animals have to literally melt snow. To get a drink of water, a moose must eat snow, often several liters worth. It takes energy to melt that snow. Red squirrels hoard their food, and martins hunt red squirrels. Great gray owls hunt both of them, and they can crash through the snow crust to get to the metal bowls that are below. Beneath the snow, the temperature is much warmer. Rough grouse will burrow into the snow. Life is not easy in Canada's boreal forest. You might call Canada's Great Plains the Canadian Serengeti. Certainly there are herds here that will remind you of the herds you see in Africa. Bison. On these plains, we can see nature's grand scheme played out. Here are predators and prey, life and death. Where you find ravens, you should look for wolves. This wolf is not a threat, it's already eaten, but when it leaves, the bison take off. Bison were found across the Great Plains, from the boreal forest to the Rocky Mountain foothills. On their migrations, they had to cross massive gorges. As the continental glaciers melted, they released a torrent of water that carved out these obstacles. These rivers drain the land, especially in the spring, and in the spring the runoff is fast. And a river crossing at this time can be dangerous. Most bison will make it, but a few, well, they don't. And their carcasses line the river and provide food for bears. But the herd goes on. In 1867, it was still possible to see sites like this. But it wasn't long before overhunting had reduced the herds, and the land seemed almost empty. All that was left were small, scattered herds of bison. And it was only by luck that they managed to be saved. Today, you can still see those herds. And the numbers are growing. There were about 450,000 bison in North America. That's down from the 30 to 40 million 
that existed in 1867. Summer is the time when the bison rut. They roll in the dust. The bulls bellow and challenge each other, roaring in defiance. The goal is to find a cow who is in breeding condition. And sometimes this takes a battle. The fights can be quite dangerous, and sometimes they're injured. A few don't survive the battles. Parts of the plains are dotted with potholes, and in these potholes you can find trumpeter swans nesting. Yellow-headed blackbirds calling. And a variety of ducks and other birds, all of which make this area their home. Many of these ponds are the result of buffaloes rolling in the dust, creating wallows that fill with water. On the region's few lakes, you can find large colonies of white pelicans. It seems odd to find pelicans here. In the spring, the noisy calls of sandhill cranes can be heard. These can be heard for several kilometers. In the hilly country of the plains, mule deer are more common. But white-tailed deer can be found in the valleys and along the rivers, wherever it is wooded. The pronghorn antelope is the fastest mammal in North America. It can run about 60 kilometers an hour. It is so fast that there are no predators alive today that can catch them. Both pronghorn and bison like to hang out in the short grasses that are found where prairie dogs abound. At one time, there were several billion prairie dogs in North America, although the Canadian prairies represent the northern part of their range. Burrowing owls live amongst them. These are one of the few owls that live in the ground. Prairie dog colonies are made up of families, one male and several females and their young. In order to communicate, they kiss Females do not leave their area and are very loyal to it. When danger is sighted, one will bark a warning, and then everyone, everyone heads into the holes. Prairie dogs have enemies, including the black-footed ferret and the badger, both of which can be found in and amongst the colonies. But coyotes also take quite a few. Coyotes can often be found hunting in the colony. When a large predator, such as a grizzly, appears, the bison bulls move towards it. They want to keep an eye on it. Summer is fleeting here, and soon the first crisp, cold air of autumn arrives. And this is the time that the elk choose to rut. Their bugles can be heard across the plains. Winter will soon arrive, and for all the animals, it is time to prepare and fatten up. Red Fox spent a lot of time hunting. They use their ears to locate small prey and then pounce on them. Coyotes do the same thing. Wolves seek a larger game. The bison are too big for a small wolf, and pronghorn are too fast. It's not long, however, before the first snows begin to fall, and the land changes from a golden color. If spring and summer were a time of plenty, winter is a bleak time with little food. The animals that can't leave or don't hibernate must make do on whatever little food they can find. Some, like the swans, migrate. Others, like eagles, seek carrion. Some animals will not make it through winter. Such is life in Canada's Serengeti. The Rocky Mountains, the mountain ramparts, have been called the spine of North America. Of all the regions in Canada's wildland, this is the wildest. This is the land that people have changed the least. Here, cougars still roam. 
and in the peaks bighorn sheep hold sway. These animals have adapted to this harsh, unforgiving land. The wolves that recolonized Yellowstone in the mid-90s came from this area. Coyotes are abundant. And it has among the most spectacular scenery in all of North America. Places like Banff and Waterton Lakes and Jasper are well known around the world. On the steep, sheer cliffs of this area, mountain goats make a living. They are well adapted for this life. Even better adapted than the bighorn sheep. Like the doll sheep we met earlier, bighorn sheep crash their heads together in ritual battles. These rams are just testing each other. The real battles happen in the fall. The area is characterized by fast-flowing rivers large waterfalls. But there are areas of calm too, where beaver can eke out in existence. And winter, well winter can return at any time. This area encompasses a variety of habitats from boreal forest and grassland to alpine tundra. It's like a microcosm of all of Canada. After a tough winter, you'll do a week you have to watch out for black bears, which may prey on them. Beaver find the spring an ideal time, and they begin to harvest the forest, building new dams and lodges, feeding on the fresh greenery. Great horned owls nest when there's still snow on the ground, and by spring, their owlets are quite large. Elk give birth in the spring. At first, the calves are too weak to follow their mothers, and they hide. Grizzly bears and black bears know where the calves generally are born, and they search these areas. Spring and summer are a time of growth. Deer antlers grow underneath a coating of velvet, and bighorn sheep add another layer of horn. Travel up to the mountain peaks, and you might see a hoary marmot feeding on grass, and above him a golden eagle. Golden eagles hunt the small animals that live here, like pika a rabbit-like animal that stores food for the winter, and its main predator, the long-tailed weasel. Pika live in loose colonies. Bighorn sheep seek the steep cliffs to give birth to their young. Mountain goats do the same thing, and they look down on a world far below them. The forest is the haunt of the great gray owl and the black bear. The variety of habitats found in the Rockies creates a rich ecosystem where you find mountain animals like mountain goats and then spruce grouse and animals you think of more of the prairie like coyotes. For most of the last century this was the stronghold of the grizzly bear. And they mix with black bears. Each species has its own preferred habitat. Ground squirrels are abundant. Bald eagles soar overhead. They nest in the tallest trees. Aspens quake in the wind. Mountain bluebirds can be found here. Forest fires are an important part of the environment. And in the alpine tundra, caribou can be found. As on the prairies, the fall season sees the beginning of the rut. Elk are really a prairie animal, but they've done quite well in the Rockies, and their bugles sound throughout the mountains. By September, snow starts to creep down from the mountain peaks. It is a signal for all the wildlife to get ready for the coming winter. Young animals have grown strong enough to escape the cougar, so life gets tougher for these cats. Unlike the forests of southern Ontario, here the predominant color is yellow. Ripening berries provide a feast for the black bear. Both grizzly and black bear will soon den up. Females with cubs are the first to den, followed by females that are expecting, and then finally the large males. Large males stay active far longer than the females. By late September, snow has pretty much arrived. 
the elk rut is just about finished, although they still enjoy a good joust every now and again. They will head to the valleys for shelter. Bull moose start their rut at the end of September. They start seeking out the females, courting them, and breeding. By mid-October, their rut is finished as well, and winter has taken over the land. Now is the time when the bighorn sheep start to gather. The males join the herds, gathering with the ewes and the lambs. This is their rut, and now the crashing of heads is serious. Winter will take its toll. Coyotes and golden eagles all benefit from those too weak to survive. Living here is a test of endurance in the majestic Rocky Mountains of Canada. Canada's wild Pacific coast. This is where people first made their entrance into North America. Throughout the area are archaeological sites that speak to this event, which may have happened up to 25,000 years ago. They followed their way south using areas that were exposed from the ice. They survived on the rich abundance of sea life, seashells, fish, sea mammals. The sea otter has the densest coat of any living mammal. It keeps it warm in these frigid waters. The abundance of fish brought in an abundance of other animals. Whales, sea lions were all found here and in the early days were probably easily hunted the largest of the sea lions, the stellar sea lion, had large colonies here. Several species of dolphin and porpoise can be found here. The largest of which is the orca, or killer whale. These animals patrol the shore looking for harbor seals and fish. Several species of seabirds can be found here as well. And perhaps most important, to this world was the abundance of salmon. Huge migrations of salmon returned each year to migrate up the rivers. And these migrations attracted all sorts of predators. Grizzly bears would come down from the mountains to feast. Black bears too joined, and so did wolves. The largest of the bears the brown bear is actually a grizzly. Brown bear is a term the Alaskans use. In Canada, they're called grizzlies. Sockeye salmon are one of the favorite prey. These fish turn red when they enter the fresh water systems. Males and females will only do this once. All will die at the end of their spawning run. Bald eagles by the hundreds gather along the rivers to feed on this fish. A unique species of wolf lives here. The Pacific gray wolf feeds on deer and bear, but it also feeds on salmon, making it unique among the wolves of the world. Canada's coastline is rugged, indented with fjords. In many places, glaciers come right down to the ocean where they calve. Along the coast, you can find several races of black bear, including the glacier bear. The Great Bear Rainforest is home to some of the tallest trees in all of Canada. This is Canada's rainforest. It's a temperate rainforest, which means it's not very hot. And it is one of the wettest places in all of Canada. Forest fires here are rare, but they do happen. And as you make your way up from the ocean side, you go through a variety of habitats. The trees grow smaller. Waterfalls are common. Open areas start to occur. This is an area only recently set free of the glaciers that once covered it. And all about you are signs of their passing. 
There are small lakes where trumpeter swans can be found. Black bear graze on the slopes. This is the alpine tundra. But unlike other places where we've seen tundra, the snow depth here is amazing. It is measured in meters. Animals that live here, like the pika, have to work doubly hard to survive. The plants that grow here must grow quickly, and they don't grow tall. Any part of a plant exposed above the snow line will certainly die. So trees here tend to be short. A tree may be a thousand years old and be only a few meters tall. This is Canada's wettest coast. It is the wettest environment to be found in Canada. But because of that, Canada's wild Pacific coast is its most diverse environment. So this is the way Canada was in 1867. 150 years further on in 2017, there is much to celebrate. We have done a lot to bring back the wildland. Southern Ontario is a good example of that resurgence. We should all take pride in the beauty of our land. From the thundering water of Niagara Falls to our Great Lakes, there is much to celebrate here. But we also face challenges. Landings turtle need large marshes, and we have very few left. On the other hand, other species are doing quite well. Ontario and Canada is rich in wildlife and birds, fish. We are one of the richest countries in the world in terms of our freshwater resources. We've taken steps to increase the population of rare animals, such as the profanatory warbler. At one time, there are only three pairs nesting here. That number is going up, slowly. The Niagara Escarpment is home to some of the oldest trees in Canada. We have some of the finest environmental protection laws in the world. And that's helped species from plants to animals. And not just the big animals. Our laws protect frogs and toads, salamanders, and snakes. You can find all sorts of animals living amongst us. Coyotes are a common resident in most cities. Bobcats are expanding their range. Red fox walk our streets. Groundhogs munch on our plants. Sandhill cranes have increased their numbers incredibly in southern Ontario. Our wetlands are home to a variety of species. Here you can find water snakes, green herons, several species of frogs, dragonflies, our largest turtle, the snapping turtle. The rare hog-nosed snake is starting to make a comeback. The Massasauga rattlesnake, Ontario's only poisonous snake, is starting to expand its range. Places like the Cardin Alvar protect rare species of plants and birds. The rewilding of Ontario and Canada is due in part to changing attitudes towards wildland and wildlife and to a shift in the economics. People are leaving the farm to live in cities and farmlands are reverting back to wildlands, meadows, forests. And this is helping wildlife, but it is also helping people. It turns out that being in nature is good. It helps people relax. It gives them something to enjoy, whether it's bird watching, nature photography, hunting or fishing, or just simply taking a walk in the woods. All of these things have proven benefits to our health. These eggs belong to a bird that can be seen nesting around schoolyards. This is a killdeer, and this is Ontario's only native cactus, the prickly pear. Studying nature can be fascinating, and bird watching is one of the fastest growing hobbies in all of North America, rivaling even golf. And through new research that's going on, plus citizen science, we've learned about changes in nature. 
Great Neck Greaves have made an appearance around the Lake Ontario shoreline. Bald Eagles are making a comeback throughout the province thanks to efforts to improve the environment. Beavers are turning up everywhere. And Osprey, like the Eagles, have also made a tremendous comeback. It seems given half a chance, nature will find a way. Turkey vultures have expanded their range. They feed on roadkill from our highways. Wildlife is doing quite well, thank you very much. And with our continued interest, it should continue to do well. Whether it's raccoons, or yellow warblers, or hummingbirds. But there are challenges. In the next 150 years, Canada and the rest of the world is going to have to figure out how to deal with climate change. Some animals will do well. Some animals will suffer. The same is true of plants. Climate change is a double-edged sword. We may well see some species disappear and new species arrive. And sometimes we will face new challenges dealing with these. And sometimes it's not all natural. We've reintroduced wild turkeys into the province. After a few tries, we finally managed to bring elk back. And there are places in Ontario where you can go and hear elk bugling. Each fall, several thousand tundra swans stop to feed on their winter migration on the shores of Lake Erie. And they are joined by an increasing number of sandhill cranes. One of the great things about living in Canada is the changing seasons. The move through winter to spring, summer to fall, and then back to winter. Life here has evolved to cope with those changes. The diversity of Canada and its natural heritage is unrivaled. It is a spectacular country and one that we should be very proud of. In the last 150 years, there has been much to celebrate. Yes, we've made mistakes. But look around you. Deer numbers are up due to good management. Peregrine falcons have returned to our skies. They even live in our cities. And yes, they feed on pigeons, which are an introduced species. Every year, snowy owls show up around the shores of Lake Ontario. Waterfowl from the Arctic migrates down here to feed. And it's not just here in Ontario, it's across Canada. We have done a lot, but we've still got a lot to do in order to keep Canada the wildland.